Good morning, Grace Church. How are we doing this morning? Doing great, man. It's a good to worship in God's house this morning. Man, it's a, it's a blessing. Well, if you guys don't know me, my name's AJ Catucci. I'm the men and young adults pastor here at Grace. If I've got any 20, 30 folks out here, any fight club guys, any men's Bible study guys, can I get, a, get, get some witnesses this morning? I got some, got some people out here. That's good. That's good. Well, I don't get an opportunity to speak a lot on Sunday, so I definitely cherish this opportunity. It's a it's an honor to be able to share with you from the word of the Lord this morning. So, but before we dive in, I want to pray. So if you guys would join me. Lord, we thank you for this day. God, thank you for, God, allowing us to come together, Father, and God, get reminded today of who you are and what you've done, Father. God, I pray this morning, Lord, as we open your word, Father, you would speak to us. Father, you would minister to us with your eternal, never-ending, life-changing words, Father. God, we thank you for this opportunity. God, we bless you this morning, and it's your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So guys, as you all know, we're, man, December 31st, 2017, about to usher in a whole new year, and there's a lot of stuff that's going to happen tonight, right? A whole slew of things across our planet are going to happen as people usher in the beginning of 2018. There's a whole lot of traditions, you know, that people take part in. Perhaps you, you might take part in some of these, whether it's counting down from 10, you know, the ball dropping in Times Square as we watch on TV. Maybe it's sipping on some champagne, kissing your beloved spouse when when the clock strikes zero tonight at midnight. I mean, there's so many things that we do to usher in the new year. I mean, how many people try to start new habits, right, in the new year, whether that's eating better, spending less money, sleeping less, try to start new lifestyle habits. And the thing about all of these is that they help bring in the new, the new year, you know, a clean slate, a fresh start, a second chance. That's why we all look forward to January 1st, because we can start again. But what I want to encourage us, church, this morning to do is while the whole world tonight is going to be looking backwards, I'm sorry, while the whole world tonight is going to be looking forward to 2018, I want to encourage us tonight, guys, to look back. And there's, there's two words, two simple words that I want to leave you with this morning as we open God's words. So these two words, forget not. Forget not. If you would, if you have your Bibles with you, go ahead and open to Psalms, the book of Psalms. We're going to be in chapter 103 this morning. Psalms chapter 103. Uh, we're going to be reading verses 1 through 5. If you don't have your Bibles, which I, again, I highly encourage you to bring your Bibles to church, but if you don't have them, uh, the text is up on the screen here. Now I'm going to ask, in honor of the reading of God's Word, if you are able, across all campuses, uh, including online, if you would stand up this morning as we read our text for this morning. You go ahead and rise in honor of the reading of God's Word. And I'd ask you to read this together with me. This is Psalm 103, verses 1 through 5. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. You may go ahead and be seated. Now some background behind this psalm I think is going to help us this morning in understanding what is going on. Now Psalm 103, as you might see just from this reading, along with Psalm 104, is a pair that's designed to stir up praise, that's designed to stir up exaltation, that's designed to stir up blessing unto God. It is really a stirring psalm, if you will. And what we're going to see um, in the end of Psalm 103, which we won't get to this morning, in verses 20, 21 and 22, what David is going to do, he's going to use these three words, bless the Lord. We're going to see it all throughout Psalm 103, but specifically in the beginning and the end of the psalm, he uses this bookend statement, three simple words, bless the Lord. And at the end of the psalm, what he does is he says, bless the Lord, O you his angels. Bless the Lord, O you his hosts. Bless the Lord, all his works. What David does at the end of the psalm is he, he, he really commands the blessing of God, the praise of God to come from all creation. It's really this corporate type of praise. But with those same three words in the beginning of Psalm 103, what David does is he says, bless the Lord, O my soul. 
Bless the Lord, all that is within me. Look at me, if you will, verse 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. So what David is doing, he's making this psalm personal. Now, for those of you who like literature or English, this might be known as a soliloquy, where somebody is speaking to themselves, and that's what David's doing here. He's speaking directly to himself. So for all of you in here who talk to yourself and people think you're crazy, we're in some good company with David, because right here, what he's doing, you might think of this in one way as David the outer man, the flesh, the body, speaking to David the inner man, his soul, all that is within him. So with this conversation almost that David is having with himself, and he's telling his soul to bless the Lord. Now, blessing the Lord simply means to praise God. He's saying, soul, everything within you, our soul's made up of our mind, our will, emotions, our conscience, really our whole being. David says, your whole being, praise God, exalt God. And that's what he's saying here in verse 1. And so if that's the objective, if the objective is this worship, this powerful worship that emanates from David's soul, if that's the objective, if that's the goal, then verse 2 is going to tell us how to get there. It's going to be the means for how we get to that deepest inward soul-rooted worship. Verse 2, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Those two words, forget not all his benefits. Now this word forget, this word forget carries with it, you might say, a lot of baggage, especially in the New Testament. This word was a word that was all too familiar with the Israelite nation. I mean, perhaps it's one that I would say described their relationship with God more than any other word, is forget. David says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not, forget not all his benefits. Now, David very well knew the history of his people. I mean, David was was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He ended up becoming the king of Israel. David knew where his people had come from. He knew his heritage, and he knew that his people often forgot God. Now, David was not going to let this same mistake happen. And we see him in this psalm reminding himself, soul, don't you forget the benefits of your God. Now, you you really don't even have to be a Christian to know the story of the Exodus. Perhaps some of the most famous stories come out of this book of the Bible After being oppressed and enslaved under Egyptian rule for about 400 years, the Israelites were miraculously freed by God, only by the hand of God. You know, you remember, you know, from Sunday school, the the 10 plagues, where God brought these horrific plagues down on Egypt, trying to get Pharaoh's attention to let the Israelites go. You know, frogs, he brought down um, uh, locusts. Eventually, he brought the angel of death which came over the land of Egypt and ended up killing Pharaoh's son. And Pharaoh had finally had enough. And after 400 years of slavery, he said, get these people out of here, Moses. Take your people and leave my land. So only by God's hand had the Israelites been freed. And we know as the story of Exodus unfolds, the Israelites are marching out of the promised land. I'm sure they're feeling great. They're not enslaved anymore. They're heading off to the land that God had promised, but... There was some bad news. Pharaoh had decided to pursue the Israelites. He wasn't going to let them go that easily. So the Israelites are marching, and they come up to the Red Sea, right? This big, impassable body of water that if they tried to go around would, would be impossible. They would definitely get caught by the Egyptian army. So they come up kind of between a rock and a hard place, if you will. Come up to the Red Sea. Moses sees the Egyptians coming. This is, the finest, this is the finest army in the world breathing down their necks. Chariots, horses, soldiers, finest trained soldiers in the world. They're going to slaughter the entire Israelite nation unless God does something. God has to do something. And so Moses, in an effort of faith, lifts up his staff and raises his voice to God. What does God do? Seas part. God parts the Red Sea. Incredible, miraculous act. The Israelites march across this sea, march across the Red Sea on dry ground. Not one of them, 
Not one of them is injured. Not one of them is killed. And then as they all make it across and the Egyptians start to come across that same dry ground, God brings those walls of water crumbling down on the Egyptian army, killing every last one of them. Now, you would think that a nation like Israel would not forget such an incredible, miraculous act of God. And that wasn't the end, right? As they started marching through the wilderness, God continued to do miracle after miracle. He sent bread from heaven. David talked about this in the last service, sending manna so that they could eat. He brought water from rocks. Later, he would literally bring quail, protein, meat, out of heaven in the middle of a desert. I mean, crazy, miraculous acts. But all of that would just become a distant memory for this nation. Psalm 106 tells us, they, in reference to the Israelites, exchanged the glory of God for the image of an ox that eats grass. They forgot God, their Savior, who had done great things in Egypt. They forgot God, their Savior, who had done great things in Egypt. And you might think, how could, how could they forget what God had done in their lives? How could they miss that? And start worshiping some golden image. Well, I would tell you this morning, church, if we're not careful, we can fall into that same sin of forgetfulness. Because as we see in Israel's history, if forgetfulness of God led to idolatry, the opposite must be true. Remembrance of God must be a root of worship. And that's what I want to talk about today. When I say these words, forget not, the words that we read from David, from his mouth, David knows this. You say, so you're not going to forget about what God has done like your people has. Forget not. And so how David's going to do this is the next three verses. He's going to use what is often used in many types of poetry called couplets, these two lines of remembrances in verses 3, 4, and 5. David's going to say, so I'm about to remind you of everything your God has done in your life. Now, scholars believe this psalm was written at the end of David's life, that he was old in age, and he was looking back, almost recounting what God had done in his life. Now, the first, the first remembrance here is found in verse 3. David says, So forget not God who forgives all your iniquity and who heals all your diseases, who, he, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases. Now, I could only imagine the emphasis in the eruption of praise that would have come out of David's mouth as he spoke or sang these words. Because if anyone knew iniquity, if anyone knew disease, it was David. Right, we know in Scripture, in David's life, he committed some pretty serious iniquity. Now, iniquity is just a, a biblical term for, for sin, a wrongdoing. Now, perhaps the most famous sin of David's was adultery. David committed adultery. He committed adultery with Bathsheba that we read about. Now, if you go to Jewish law, kind of like if you were to go to our modern law in the land, and you looked up, okay, what's the penalty for adultery? According to Leviticus 20 and Deuteronomy 22, David deserved the death penalty. The result of adultery, according to the law they had at that time, was the death penalty. Now, on top of adultery, right, what else did David do? Murder. So, after he impregnated Uriah's wife, he then sent Uriah, one of his most loyal soldiers, to the front line of battle, so that he would die. And that's what happened. Premeditated murder on top of adultery. So now, according to Genesis 9 and Exodus 21, David deserved the death penalty for premeditated murder. Two accounts, David is now supposed to die. Death penalty in that day is probably stoning. Tied up to a pole, rocks thrown at you until you're knocked out, dead, unconscious. David knew that. 
David knew that that was the penalty for his sins. But look at 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 13. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. The Lord has put away your sin. Look at, David knew that he was supposed to, he said, I've sinned against the Lord. And now, as God spoke through the prophet Nathan, God says to David, the Lord's put your sin away. Could you imagine knowing that you're supposed to die and God pardons him? And so David's saying, Saul, don't forget the God who forgave all your iniquity and has healed your deadly disease of sin. Forget not Forget not. The second reminder is going to come in verse 4 as David describes God as one who redeems your life from the pit and who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. Now, many of you know that David was a warrior. There's a lot of warriors in this room. But David wasn't just an ordinary warrior. He was an upper echelon warrior. At one point, he was known for killing 200 Philistines by himself. Now, you know, as a war, if you put yourself in that kind of danger, the chances of you dying are very high. But we know that didn't happen to David. God had protected him from every arrow, from every spear, from every chariot, from every foreign soldier that tried to kill him. God protected him, even though 10,000 might fall at my right hand. God protected David in the midst of war. But not only that, we also know from David's life that he was protected from the hands of other sinful men and even other dangers, right? We remember in his life, in his youth, God protected him from the jaw of the lion that tried to kill him as he was protecting his sheep, the jaw of the bear, right? The javelin of Saul as he was running from Saul, cave to cave to cave. Not only that, the famous story in the Bible, Goliath, God had had his hand of providence on David his whole life. And David is saying, Saul, don't you forget that. Don't you forget the God who has redeemed your life countless times from the pit of death. Don't forget your God who's also crowned you. David, right, was crowned as the king of Israel, but he's saying, my God has crowned me with steadfast love. And mercy. David recounts his whole life and how God had shown him constant mercy and love. And the final reminder that David gives to his soul comes in verse 5. He says, Soul, don't you forget. Don't you forget. Forget not that God is the one who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Now David knew, I would say in mind and heart, that God was the only one who could satisfy his soul. David went after everything else. He went after adultery. He went after murder. He went after the things of the world, only to find, only to find that it didn't satisfy. And so he's reminding his soul, soul forget not the God who can satisfy your soul. Now, maybe you've come in here this morning. I see a lot of familiar faces, but I also see a lot of new faces. And I've just read off the benefits of God as David has experienced them. His steadfast love, his mercy, his redemption, his healing, his forgiveness. And maybe you're sitting there and you're like, so what, dude? So what? Who cares? Maybe you've lived a life racked with so much pain and tragedy. That you're wondering, this God that I'm talking about even exists. Maybe you're sitting in here, and you've done so many terrible things. And if you laid them on the table, you would wonder if there's a God in the universe that could pardon your sin. Or maybe like David, you've tried to satisfy your soul with adultery, with murder. Maybe you've tried to satisfy your soul with money, religion. 
sex, booze, drugs, whatever it might be, only to find that you keep coming up short, that your soul still cries out, why can't I be satisfied? Can I tell you today that the only satisfaction, the only satisfaction for your soul can be found in Christ. There is no other. David looked forward to this Christ. We look backwards this morning. Forget not. Can I tell you today, I want to tell you something that is good news. Good news that we as Christians celebrate that God can forgive all of your iniquity because the iniquity of the saints has been laid on Jesus. Isaiah 53 tells us, all we like sheep have gone astray and the Lord has laid on him, Christ, the iniquity of us all. 2 Corinthians 5.21, for our sake, for the Christ follower's sake, God made him, Jesus, to become sin, who knew no sin, so that we could become the righteousness of God. I'd also like to tell you that God can heal your eternally devastating, destroying disease of sin because Jesus bore that sin that disease on his back on the cross of, of Calvary. Matthew 8, 17, he took up our infirmities and bore our diseases. And I'd like to tell you too that God can redeem your life. He can redeem your life from the pit because Jesus Christ was the payment or the ransom for that redemption. Jesus' life is that payment that can redeem your life. He can purchase you and save you and redeem you just like he did David. So don't think that this account that David was writing is some far off antiquated writing that doesn't relate to you. Because this God has not changed. His word has not changed. It's eternal, firmly fixed in the heavens. 1 Timothy 2 says, there is one God, there's one mediator between God and man, the one who stood in the gap, Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all at the proper time. Lastly, God can crown you. Yes, he can crown you with steadfast love and mercy because his son was crowned with flesh penetrating thorns. John 19.5 tells us Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And perhaps lastly, the one that sits with me the strongest is that God can satisfy the longings of your soul and renew your youth like the eagles. And I can tell you why he can do that. Because the wrath of God has been satisfied in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Romans 5 tells us, Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. I can tell you this morning that all of that is possible through Jesus Christ. All of it. And this is what we remember. This is what we forget not. This is what David was saying. So forget not what your God has done. And if you're not in Christ this morning, I pray that these words that come from God would penetrate your heart and soul. And I pray that if the Lord is calling you and he grants you repentance, that you would turn to him and that he would become your Lord and Savior, that there would be full, outright surrender to the Lordship of Jesus and that you would no longer be walking in darkness or lukewarmness or whatever it might be. That's my prayer for you this morning. Now, I want to give you three just simple takeaways from this passage. Three simple takeaways that can help us not forget. And the first one, takeaway number one, do not neglect your personal remembrance of God. Do not neglect your personal remembrance of God. Right? Because what David's doing in the beginning of this passage, he's talking to himself. He says, so don't forget. Forget not. Forget not, forget not, forget not. And he lists the benefits of God. So in your own life, as followers of Jesus, how do we not forget? 
Well, there's multiple ways that you can bring to personal remembrance what God has done. Prayer. Prayer is just as much of a reminder as anything. Right? When we sit down one-on-one with God and recall what he's done, God, thank you for saving me. Thank you that you've chosen me. I have no idea why. I haven't done anything to deserve this. Thank you for healing my disease of sin. Thank you for forgiving me. It reminds you and should lead you into a blessing, exaltation, eruption. Thank you, Father, for what you've done. Do not neglect your personal remembrance of God. There's multiple other ways. Reading scripture, reminder. Memorizing scripture, reminder. Meditating on scripture. Your personal remembrance of God. Sharing your testimony. Bringing back to mind what God has done. Never letting that go out of your scope of view. Don't neglect your personal remembrance of God. The second one, and we didn't get to it this morning, but it's what David does at the end of the message, at the end of the psalm, is do not neglect the corporate remembrance of God. Please do not neglect the corporate remembrance of God. And what I mean by that, right at the end of the psalm, David says, bless the Lord all creation. Now what we do here on Sunday, this is corporate remembrance of God. Why do, why do we meet weekly? Because we need to be reminded weekly of what God has done and who he is. Because like the hymn says, we are like sheep, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. So this, what we do every week, is so important. Hebrews commands us to not forsake the gathering, but meet more often as you see that last day drawing near. Another way to corporately remember God is to be be involved in, in a small group of some kind or some kind of relationships with other people where they can speak into you and remind you and you can remind them. There's multiple ways to join in corporate remembrance of God. And then the last thing I want to leave us with this morning, and it's going to lead us into our last part of our service this morning, is do not neglect the sacraments. Please, and then this is, I think this is huge because we often drift from this. Do not neglect the sacraments. And The sacraments is communion. It's what Jesus told his followers to do after he left. He said, guys, every time you gather to eat or drink, do this. Take the sacraments in remembrance of me so that you would not forget the great sacrifice that he made. Guys, we can't forget. We can never forget. And I know I'm so prone to but forget what it cost God to save anyone. Don't forget this morning that Jesus came down in the likeness of men. He left the throne of heaven, the throne of perfection to come down to this busted, broken world and become a human and live a perfect, sinless, spotless, stainless life, never doing wrong once, in word or deed or in his heart. And then he willingly subjected himself to be killed by his own creation, to be killed by sinful men and women on a cross. And not just a cross, a rugged piece of wood that splinters dug into his back after he was flogged, ripping skin so much off his back that his ribs were probably exposed. And then stakes like railroad spikes driven into his hands and his feet. The story didn't end there. He hung on that cross for hours, gasping, pushing up so that he might get some air in his lungs. But eventually he'd give out and say, it is finished. And then on the third day, (laughs) on the third day, he said, I'm back alive again. Jesus rose up from the dead. Guys, don't forget this. We we can simplify this. Jesus rose from the grave, and he's still alive today. This same God who saved me offers the hand of salvation to any man or woman who would call upon his name, to any man who would confess him as Lord and Savior. This offer is on the table. And he extends that hand of mercy freely. So I pray this morning that if you need to respond to that, you would do so. 
Because I can tell you, folks, if the Lord is calling you to become one of his, you can't outrun it. The word of the Lord will achieve what he's purposed it to achieve. So if you're trying to run away from God every Sunday you come in here thinking you're going to escape him, well, I'm just going to come to church. I'm going to live a nominal life. I'm going to be a good person, and I'm going to earn my way into heaven. You cannot outrun the call of God on you. It's impossible. I know because I've tried. So stop running. And if you would realize who you're running away from, you wouldn't want to run because this is a God who loves with love. We can't even comprehend. And he says that he takes pleasure in the death of nobody. Nobody. Wishing that none should perish. So this morning, I would ask you, the Lord, you know the Lord is calling you. Surrender. Surrender to him.